Aha! I had a feeling you'd be back. You know what? I was a lot happier before I believed in ghosts. Yo, what changed your mind? Doesn't matter. What does matter is that right now, up in that temple, somebody's about to release 13 of the most terrifying ghosts upon the face of the Earth. So, we'll need one of everything. Oh, wow, okay, um, let me just have you fill out, uh, uh, no, right, of course, time is of the essence if you're gonna... Wait, did you say 13 ghosts? Hey gang, and welcome to an all new episode of a podcast named Scooby-Doo Extra. Now if you've caught one of my extra episodes previously, you know what they're all about. If this is your first time, uh, a little background. Basically the extra episodes are designed to run parallel to the podcast proper, podcast named Scooby-Doo. Uh, podcast named Scooby-Doo is designed to, uh, through interviews and conversation, basically create an oral history of the last 50 years of the Scooby-Doo franchise. What I wanted to do with the extra episodes is they're basically a bit of a sidestep in that they're more about added value content, which is why I called the show Extra. I think a lot of the releases in the last, oh man, decade or more of uh, Scooby-Doo stuff has been somewhat lacking in commentaries and behind the scenes stuff and uh, anything that would be considered added value content. So the extra episodes are designed to create that and put that out there for people like me, people like you, if you're listening to this, this is the kind of stuff that you are interested in. You want more, you want some behind the scenes stuff. Uh, you know, it's not just eight or nine year olds uh, watching this stuff anymore. It's a 50 year old franchise. There's people who are interested. This is this is a character who's part of animation history. This is a cultural staple. Everybody's got Scooby-Doo in their life. Love it or hate it. So this episode is actually going to be a little bit of a departure from what I usually do with the extra episodes, because the way I usually use it is to do the commentaries. Um, anybody who comes onto the show, I give them the opportunity to do a commentary over an episode or, or several, and... Uh, have kind of a scene specific conversation this these this episode is an interview episode kind of trying this out kind of stretching what i can do with the extra episodes but it seemed kind of thematically appropriate because the conversations that i'm having are sort of content specific uh, we are talking specifically about curse of the 13th ghost currently available as a digital download for purchase or rent also on dvd and I don't mind plugging this movie at all because I really enjoyed it and I think it's really fun. So if you haven't checked it out, like buy it, rent it, check it out. There are worse ways that you could spend 80 minutes, is all I'm saying. But as I was saying, the, the conversations were content specific. I speak to the film's writer, Tim Sheridan. I also speak to one of the stars of the film, the wonderful and talented Gray Griffin, who of course does the voice of Daphne Blake, has been the voice of Daphne Blake for some time. And the focus of the chat was this movie. So I thought, since we're not really doing like a broad kind of deep dive overview like I do with so many other people, I was gonna make it an extra episode. I also wanted to rush it out. I wanted to get it out as soon as possible because the, the film did come out on February 5th, which was a while ago and I wanted to keep it sort of as current with the content. And I, I just recorded these interviews today. I'm editing and, and doing this today. It's kind of like a 24 hour marathon thing to get this out there. And I also thought for my own kind of personal OCD logistical reasons, I've got that Jeff Parker interview, which is halfway through. I haven't released part two yet and I didn't want to screw up my numbering. So sue me, it is what it is. But by the way, if you haven't checked out the Jeff Parker interview, great interview. If you dig Johnny Quest, go check it out. If you dig Johnny Quest or the DC Hanna-Barbera comic books that, that DC has been publishing, go check it out. It's a great conversation. 
But back to this episode, uh, Tim Sheridan, writer of Gourmet Ghost, writer of Curse of the Thirteen Ghost, Gray Griffin, voice of Daphne Blake. Two amazing talents, two amazing conversations. So thrilled they had the time to come on and chat with me. And I'm going to let you get to that conversation right away. Uh, just to let you know, I speak to Tim first, and then uh, there's going to be a bumper, and then Gray comes immediately afterwards. So it's about 45 minutes to an hour long, and they each constitute kind of about half of that running time. Could have split them up, but again, thematically, they're tied. So I'm making the decisions here. It's my podcast. I'm going to do it how I want to do it. That's just how, that's how it's going to be. So I hope you guys get as much of a kick out of listening to these conversations as I did having them. I'm going to let you get to them right away. So enjoy, and I will see you on the other side. Oh, man. I know that glow. Shaggy? Shaggy, is that you? Did that thing just... Kids, I've been trying to reach you on this thing for months. Daphne, Shaggy, Scooby-Doo, where are you? So I'm here talking to Tim Sheridan, who is the writer of Scooby-Doo and the Curse of the 13th Ghost. How you doing? Available right now on digital download and, and home video. <laughs> Run out and get your coffee if you haven't gotten one yet. Tim, welcome to the program. Well, thanks for having me, Mike. So something I ask uh, pretty much everybody on the show, uh, I start off with, what was your first contact with Scooby-Doo? Is this something you watched as a kid or something you came to later in life? Oh, uh, I, it's so funny. It's such an interesting question. I can't imagine that anybody answers it differently. It's like Scooby-Doo has always been a part of my life. <laughs> um, I mean, I was just always, always on TV. Uh, so I think my first... I was thinking the only people who would answer that question differently would be maybe Joe Ruby and Ken Spears. <laughs> <laughs> Probably true. Um, yeah, I think... I know I watched Scooby-Doo, Where Are You?, before I ever saw uh, 13 Ghosts of Scooby-Doo. So I'm sure it was Where Are You was the, my way in. And uh, But when I was a kid, 13 Ghosts of Scooby-Doo was the new series that was coming on. I was very, very excited about it. They used to have, um, they used to have a, the preview uh, like on like a Friday night or something, every season, every TV season where they would show you clips and, and they would promote the new cartoons that were coming on. Oh, yeah, and they would have, like, hosts from another show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I remember seeing, uh, that was, I think, the first time I saw uh, 13 Ghosts, the concept for 13 Ghosts in Scooby-Doo. And, I mean, I was just hooked, absolutely hooked right away. I couldn't wait, couldn't wait to watch. <laughs> so Curse of the 13th Ghost is your second kick at the cat, uh, having previously written Gourmet Ghost. And I'm assuming that things went well enough with Gourmet Ghost that they invited you back right away to do the next one. Um, I, I guess that's right. I guess that's how it went. <laughs> did they come I, to you uh, with it, or did you have to pitch it? No, uh, they they came to me. Um, it was the idea. So, so G Gourmet Ghost happened in a, a very strange sort of fun way, which was I had, I had been sort of kicking around Warner Brothers just for a, 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 a not, just a few months, really. And um, I'd written some episodes of a series called Justice League Action, and uh, Jim Krieg was running that show with Alan Burnett. And I, I, I got to know those guys pretty well. And I guess, this is what I heard later on, I guess Jay Bastian, the executive, was talking to Alan Burnett about that they wanted to do a, a food TV-related Scooby-Doo movie. And Alan said, I don't watch food TV. I don't know anything <laughs> about food TV celebrities or anything. He said, but you know, Tim Sheridan was in my office yesterday, and he was talking about Food Network the whole time he was here. <laughs> I bet you know so that stuff. So I went and I met with Jay, and we started chatting about it, and we had a good meeting, and he said, do you want to write this thing? I said, yeah, absolutely. So, um, so I guess, you know, yeah, it went well enough that um, when Jay was putting together an idea for the next cycle of, of movies, um, and uh, Jim Krieg was overseeing them uh, as the co-producer, then he, um, 
Jim uh, asked me if I had any interest in writing a sequel slash sort of finale maybe to 13 Ghosts of Scooby-Doo. And I said, are you kidding me? Um, because I had just gotten to write the, uh, a movie called Reign of the Superman, yeah. uh, DC movie. And that, Reign of the Superman, were the first Superman comics I ever thought and read as a kid. <laughs> and then right after that, they say, oh, do you want to write this 13 Ghosts? Thing. And I said, what is this magical wonderland I'm in where I just get to, they hand me the keys to these incredible things, you know, for a, for a short time. And so, yeah, it was, it was a very exciting thing, and I'm very happy that they, that they called me. It's a dangerous place to be, because, like, where do you go from here now, right? <laughs> oh, I know, I know. Well, there's plenty. Listen, I'm, I'm a child of the 80s. There's plenty of... Uh, of stuff still out there that's, that's right back. I'm, I'm actually writing on a show right now that, uh, that I never dreamed that I would get to, to work on, um, a property that I never dreamed I'd get to work on from the eighties. And it's a, it's just a, yeah, it's incredible. It, it's an incredible time to work in animation. It really is. There's just a lot happening. So now you have this project, 13th ghost, we're going to bring some closure to this old series. What are you thinking as you sit down to write this? <laughs> Especially knowing that, you know, you were a fan and if there's any, like, pressure on this. You know, it's, um, it's funny. I think a lot of people, I think a lot of people have the idea that, you know, you like something like this. I think there are people out there who think that I, like, walked into Warner Brothers one day and said, I want to do a 13 Ghost uh, sequel and, and, uh, and I've got this great idea and here it is. And, you know, it's just, almost never how it works. You know, they, Warner Brothers, they have real ideas about Scooby-Doo and uh, about everything they do, but they have a really amazing people whose job it is to, um, you know, to, to maintain the, uh, the, 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 that, that, you know, that I want to say brand because it's more than just a brand. It's a, it's, uh, you know, this global phenomenon, this thing that's been, yeah. And, um, and so, so they have ideas about what they want to do. And they, they knew they wanted to do a, a 13 Ghosts thing. And Jim Krieg and Jay Bastian had kicked it around, I think. And, and they had some ideas about what we would do and what we wouldn't do. And, and then we, Jim and I sat down with another uh, great writer friend of mine, Jeremy Adams, um, who a lot of people know from the Scooby Natural episode of Supernatural. We, we, we sat down and we kicked around and sort of broke the story and figured out sort of what this thing was going to be. And, uh, you know, keeping the mandates that were in place uh, from WB. And, you know, we, we came up with this, this story that I went off and, and wrote. Were you aware of, like, the kind of grassroots interest? The, the, the So many people online have been talking, at least in the Scooby-Doo community, have been talking about, you know, they never caught the 13th ghost. Are they ever going to catch the 13th ghost? I think they've been peppering Tom Ruger with this question for like the last decade. Okay. So the minute that they called me in and I sat down and they said, I remember I was in Jay Bastion's office and they said, we're going to do uh, 13 ghosts of Scooby-Doo, but we have to figure out a way in. Like how, why would we be doing this thing now? And I was the nerd in, in the room who said, um, they never caught the 13th ghost. <laughs> and they said, what? I said, yeah, it was 13 episodes. They let them all go in the first one. And then they caught 12 after that. I mean, it's obviously I know fans, there's a lot of questions about if they really caught 12 and how it works. I, I always went in thinking that the, the ghost ship uh, was, was like one ghost. Um, which had multiple ghosts within it, but um, that, that that was kind of the, the idea. Or at least they, they, they encountered 13, they, they encountered 12 ghosts or 12 things from the, the chest of demons. Right. We also knew that, look, there's also the possibility that there were things that were happening off screen that we didn't know about. So, um, so it seemed like the right hook to go in. And, and then it was just something that I knew sort of intuitively. And I think that, Happily, we we discovered that yeah, I mean, there were a lot of other fans like me out there who said, you know, this never really felt like it got a resolution, 
and let's you know figure out what we can do uh, to to get get that last ghost in the chest. Did you go back and rewatch the thirteen episodes to mine it for ideas? Yeah, yeah. Let me tell you, I hadn't watched them in. I mean, I guess probably since I was a kid, and I wouldn't. I wouldn't say it was to mine ideas so much as it was to sort of know where we were starting from. Like, what, what, what were we left with? Where, where were we? When I found, what I, what I found was, it was so surprising, which happens so often. I, I didn't, I, I'd forgotten, I guess when you're a kid, you don't really understand the tone of something. At least I didn't. And I didn't remember that the tone was so fun and tongue-in-cheek and... Uh, in many ways, a different sense of humor than Scooby-Doo, Where Are You? So I, I, I loved discovering that, uh, rediscovering that uh, in, in this process. But yeah, I went back I, I, I went back and watched everything. In fact, and not just me. I mean, everybody went back and watched everything. The producers, the director, the, the, uh, I'm sure a lot of the crew did as well. Um, you know, we ended up in a, in a place where I had, I had written a very short, uh, in the original draft, version of an opening uh, spell that uh, Vincent Van Gogh was casting that uh, sort of set up the premise for the movie. But it was just a few lines. It was very simple. And our incredible producer, Jennifer Coyle, uh, called me one day and she said, I want to blow this out. I want this to be the opening title sequence. So can you write me like six more stanzas for this thing? <laughs> and I love, I love challenges like that. And I said, you got it. <laughs> and I think the next day, I think we were ready to record a voice record the next day. And I walked in and like handed them over to her and she's like, Oh my gosh, like you really worked. I think we have to cut some of these. I probably gave her tons, you know, <laughs> but I thought it was a great way to sort of, you know, remind everybody what, what happened in the original series, who the ghosts were, and sort of take us on that journey again. I know Jen really wanted to do that. And it was the, I think it was the right thing to do. It was a great opening title sequence. Like like you said, it just kind of takes you through the previous sort of series and brings you up to speed. And for fans who knew about it, you know, it, it brings back that nostalgia and the memories. And for the fans who don't know about it, it's just, it's fun exposition. So... You know, that's Nicely the done. thing, though, with, <laughs> with these. <laughs> Why, thank you. That's the thing with these is that, yeah, there's nostalgia for the for those of us who grew up with the series. But you know, Scooby Doo is for everybody, and I I kept wondering. I'm like, is any, are, are kids really going to understand what this is and what it's referencing? And you know, hopefully they'll 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 watch the the old series and understand you know where 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 we are in the world. I mean, it is strange because we have we're explaining to Fred and Velma what's going on, and because they weren't there, so we have to address that. And I don't, I, I think that kids, if they didn't watch the original, would think, well, why are they having to explain this to them? Where were Fred and Velma? So we try to sort of work that in in a way so you'd understand, you know, well, they well they were off at camp that summer, and uh, this is what happened to them. It is a nice balance because for anybody who hasn't watched the the 13 Ghosts of Scooby-Doo, they're in Fred and Daphne's position. And for anybody who has, or sorry, Fred and Velma's position. And for anybody yeah. who has, they're in Daphne, Shaggy, and Scooby's position. So it just right. which, kind of which, which it dictates your perspective I, on the film. Yeah, and, and, and that, that's exactly right. And I think that we, um, we, we decided early on that we would, you know, you, so often you separate, you know, the group. That's kind of a thing that, you know, you do. And I said, you know, we, we really need to separate Fred and Velma so they can have their own sort of journey. And, uh, and, and, and they need to get up to speed. But our other heroes from the old series are up to speed already. So we need to start with them and throw them right into the middle of it, which, which was a great, great advantage. Um, and it allowed us to, to bring in, uh, a, you know, what was originally going to be a fun surprise for uh, for the whole gang uh, that Fred and Velma encountered, a character uh, who turned out to be uh, a character from the old series, but I think they I think we showed everybody spoiled it in the trailer for the movie. <laughs> so, yeah. so it was originally was supposed to be sort of a fun reveal. I think that was the, the way it was intended. But you know, hey, we got to put everything in the trailer because you know it's, it was an exciting exciting thing to have him back. So we wanted to make sure people knew. 
Now, you mentioned being away at camp, and there has been some discussion as to what is the timeline with Curse? Is it post-86? Are we... Are we bringing 13th Ghost into a more sort of contemporary context? Or is there like a huge span of time between the two? What was your kind of vision for it? This is where we get into really fun territory where I think a lot of fans think that there is a, a Scooby-Doo timeline on the on a big whiteboard or something at oh, Warner Brothers. <laughs> and I mean, the, there would, there's not enough red yarn in the world to go like back and forth and up and down to connect all the things to try to figure out the continuity of all of it. Um, I think um, here's, we, we, it was very simple for, for us. And this is part of the sort of the mandate that, that I was handed and that we went into this thing with was let's thematically, let's look at this like it is a sequel series to Scooby-Doo or a, a sequel story to Scooby-Doo, Where Are You? Let's the original concept, the original characters, the way they thought, the way they, you know, did their thing. Um, that's what's in the past for us. We also uh, included Zombie Island in that sort of past for them, which complicates things a little bit timeline wise, I understand. Uh, but, but we needed to do that for other reasons. And, and that was really all we went in with. We didn't want to connect it really seriously to to any any of the other incarnations uh, that have any wonderful incarnations that have have existed uh, over time so it was, it was we simplified it for ourselves and said let's just treat these characters like they are the characters from scooby doo where are you who had this zombie island side adventure but uh, and 13 ghosts of scooby doo side adventure and now here we are now that's a great continuity answer and i'm sure there are some people who are going to be very happy to hear oh, and, and there are going to be people who are infuriated <laughs> what so, i meant by timeline was just like how much time would you say since they had their 13 ghosts of scooby-doo adventures to the film like would you say it was a summer a year five years oh it's, yeah it's funny that you ask that we we kind of kick that around a lot um origi- the original idea was that it was it happened last summer uh, for them when, okay. when they had the 13 Ghost Adventure. That's definitely how some people read it. Uh, uh, that was the original, and I think we ended up sort of hedging that a little bit. I think. I don't remember how it turned out, but I think what we say in the movie is that it was a recent summer, but not necessarily the very last one for them. But they are... The, the idea... Uh, there's some dialogue in the beginning of the movie that says that they are aging out of this. You know, that they're about to turn 18... And yeah. they're going to be they're going to be tried as adults if they you know <laughs> if, they, if they screw up anything, and uh, so that they really need to put this this mystery solving stuff to bed. So the, that's, that's that's the idea is that they were in high school when when that stuff happened, and uh, and they're getting ready to finish high school. Now Daphne has a much greater expanded role in the film, creating a slightly different dynamic. I'm assuming with the writing and with the gang. Uh, I was wondering what it was like to shift the focus like that, if it was uh, challenging or a nice change, because uh, I know you previously wrote the gang in Gourmet Ghost, which was a more traditional sort of gang dynamic, so just kind of your thoughts on that. You know, I, th- this movie, one of the big themes in the movie uh, is about our characters' roles in the group dynamic, you know, where they fit in the group. And, you know, you really see that with Fred and Daphne and Velma uh, in this. You know, Daphne in particular, that was just a huge gift and a huge opportunity, knowing that, I mean, a lot of people look at the original series of 13 Ghosts and they say, well, Daphne wasn't really like a, you know, leader character. And I, I, all I can say is that's how I saw her when I was, you know, she was the she was the serious one. She was the one to me as a kid who was really, you know, when all, when all the, when you had to turn to somebody, she'd be the one you'd turn to because she was, had the most gravitas for me as a kid. So that's how she lived in my memory. And I said, what a great opportunity to really expand her role and show her to be a totally in control, you know, super cool leader type. 
and let's play that up. And what that afforded us was the opportunity to, to, to sort of question, you know, what, what, is, what is Fred's role? Um, what does he think his role is? What, what is it going to be? What could it be? So we tried to, you know, have some fun with that. I mentioned earlier some of the balancing that you did uh, with this movie. Uh, another thing that you balanced was the supernatural and sort of skeptical sides of the story. Uh, you never quite commit to showing any actual magic or ghosts, it's just to keep that consistency. Yeah. No, I, guess. I you know you're, you're absolutely right. It, it was it was the, this is where we get into the territory of sort of like the parameters that were set up before I even walked in the room. It was something that WB felt strongly about was let's they felt like uh, at the time when we started this project but there was sort of a confusing thing about Scooby-Doo where sometimes, a couple of times in the past, the ghosts have been real, but traditionally in Scooby-Doo, the ghosts are not real. There are people in costumes pulling real estate stamps. So that sort of overall question mark was what led us into this in the first place. And, Originally, I think the, there were ideas, there were a lot of ideas going both ways. First, I think some people said, you know, let's just do the real thing. The ghosts are real and, and everything is really happening and, and, uh, and it happened before and let's play with that. And then I think we looked at it the other direction. I'll say, well, what if it's completely, absolutely no, that it's a, it's a fake, there, that it's a person pulling a scam, just like all the original Scooby-Doo's, uh, and then I think where we ended up, uh, hopefully that's the way it reads, is we kind of leave it up in the air a little bit. Uh, if you are a person who believes that ghosts are real in their universe, um, there's an argument to be made that this, these things were real and it really happened. Um, and then if you're a skeptic, um, there are uh, reasons and clues in this story that make you realize that, yeah, it could have all been a complete scam the whole thing you know i I don't feel like that is a cop-out i think that what we did was we wanted to make sure that everybody felt like they got the finale sequel series uh, sequel to the series that they wanted that they saw so we left it a little bit up for interpretation i mean i i know what i what i believe (laughs) um but i'm not going to tell you (laughs) We're running out of time here, so I've got a couple more questions I'm just going to get through. Uh, we talked about returning characters. I really like what you did with Flim Flam. Uh, really kind of redeemed that character for me. And uh, it was a very reduced role, and I wondered if uh, there were any plans to do more with him, perhaps, and which maybe changed in the production process. And also, the question everybody is asking, where was Scrappy? <laughs> yeah, um... So when I, when I started this, the, um, by the way, thank you for, for saying that about Flim Flam. Uh, I felt, um, re- I was really happy with, with how, where we got with Flim Flam. Um, and uh, when we went into this, there were voices who said, you know, you, here are, you know here, these are the parameters and we can do this, but, you know, no Flim Flam, no Scrappy. And I said, uh, you know, I had, well, you you know, you just have to kind of choose your battles. And I said, you know, let's, let's see what we can get through the writing process and see if I can make those characters work for this, then, then we'll do it. And I, I could not, I just could not make scrappy work with the story that I was telling and with all the different, there's so many characters and so many things to do. And um, and since that was something that they wanted to shy away from anyway, I I left uh, Scrappy you know out of it. Um, but I felt strongly like I could I could make Flim Flam I could re- I could do something to redeem him and try to make him uh, a little bit more of a compelling character that makes you want more, which I think is the genesis of your question. It's like well. You know, now we like this character now. Let's well, let's see more of them. And I think that's well, I would have loved to have done been able to do that for people with Scrappy. Um, I don't think I was the guy to do it, uh, but hopefully we'll get we'll get that in another movie. Um, but I'm you know at Flim Flam the everything came together the right way for that character. I don't think he could have been a major player in the story. I think he needed to 
be on the fringe and then come in, swoop in at the end. And, uh, and I think that we had, you know, just the design was great. The, the, uh, the actor was terrific. I mean, I couldn't believe, I went to that record, I couldn't believe how good he was. It was a, a convergence of a lot of things that I think made it, made me happier about that character than I had been when I was a kid. <laughs> Well, it's nice to hear that there was an attempt made at Scrappy. That's that's something. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, there's, there's, I know, I know, a lot of people are disappointed about about Scrappy not being part of it. I, you know, Scrappy often is not a part of these things, and um, I I understand what where people are coming from. Um, you know, hopefully we're we're going to be able to figure out and have a, a Scrappy Renaissance uh, at some point. <laughs> So what's next for Tim? More Scooby? Um, I, I don't know. I, not on the horizon right now. I hope so. I'd love to do more. But uh, I've been doing stuff for um, PC comics uh, movies, uh, animated movies. So there's some sort of things that I've been clicking on with that stuff. And I'm also working on some things that, um, that are outside of uh, the, the Warner Brothers animation world. But uh, there's, there's lots more things coming, and that's the great thing about animation is I've been working on things for a couple of years that nobody knows about yet yeah. that, are, that are about to come out. I've got a, I wrote some episodes of a new series that's uh, coming out uh, next week. They haven't announced me as a writer on it, so I can't really talk about it yet. But, um, you know, you, you cook on these things, and then two years later, it's like, oh, yeah, I, I, I did write for that thing. <laughs> so lots more stuff coming. <laughs> All right, well, that's time for us. Uh, thanks so much, Tim, for taking the time to chat with us about Scooby-Doo Curse of the 13th Ghost, available right now on digital download and DVD. I'm not sure if it's available on Blu-ray. I haven't seen one. But... Uh, DVD, just DVD right now. Just DVD? Okay. So grab one if, uh, if you haven't already, and uh, yeah, thanks a lot, Tim. All right, you take care. Mmm. <laughs> You can really taste the demons. Spicy. We are talking now with Gray Griffin, the voice of Daphne Blake on pretty much every iteration of Scooby-Doo for the last uh, couple decades now. Uh, how are you doing, Gray? I'm great. Jeepers, I'm doing great. I mean, it's awesome <laughs> to still Daphne after all this time. <laughs> I actually had a chance to meet you, I can't remember what year it was, it was the first Saskatoon Expo, you were here and I moderated your panel, which basically oh. meant I sat next to you while you just ran the show. <laughs> <laughs> I tend to uh, ramble on. Um, I do remember Saskatoon so well, I, everyone was so nice, and I remember I was excited because the, the smoking man from the X-Files was there, and so I was yes. starstruck that whole weekend. <laughs> oh, okay, so actual questions now. Yeah. How did you first experience Scooby Doo? Um, did you watch it as a kid? Was it something you came to, you know, professionally uh, when you started working on it, or has it just always been in your life? I, I remember watching it when I came home from school. I was a latchkey kid, so I would always like, you know, get a tub of ice cream and get myself situated on the couch and watch Scooby Doo. And, and Kung Fu would come on after that, I remember, in our area. So I would watch a little Scooby Doo, a little Kung that's, Fu. That's a nice double header. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, that's some Rocky Road. Um, I had just, and it's just so funny because I would just have never dreamt that I would be able to be the voice of Daphne. And for so long, you know, I, I, I'm so honored. So, yeah. So you originally took over the role after Mary Kay Bergman. Yes. And if I'm not mistaken, modeled your version somewhat after Mary Kay Bergman's? Is that incorrect? Well, it was so it was so weird for me and, and just sad because, you know, she and, she was my teacher yeah. and, and a friend. You know, she was just, um, and she was the original Timmy on Fairly Odd Parents. And we had just started doing Fairly Odd Parents together. So it was amazing because I was so excited about working alongside the woman who kind of taught me everything I knew about voiceovers and voice matching and just doing all that stuff. So it was just, so so heartbreaking when she passed away and her husband was staying with me at the time because he was really grieving and um and then the, the audition came out for her to, and it was so immediate it wasn't even you know maybe even like a couple weeks after she had passed away and 
and all of a sudden they were, you know, they, they were already trying to voice match her, and it was just very strange and sad, and I didn't want to read on it. I told him, I'm, I said, they want me to read for Daphne, but I just, I just, I can't listen to this tape. They'd made a tape of her voice for me to learn her voice, and of course I knew her voice very well, and, um, and she was just such a chameleon. She could do any voice, and she worked really hard at doing voice matches, um, and I just couldn't do that, even though she had taught me how to do it and how to do it well. I just said, I'm going to go in. He said, great. She was, you were her student and her friend, and she would have wanted you to do it. If anybody gets it, it would, you know, she would have wanted you to do it. And I said, I know, but I just, I just can't, I can't listen to her voice. I'm not going to be able to voice match that. I can go in and just do the best Daphne that I can do, but I just, I, I don't know if I can study her voice. It's just too painful. So I went in and, and did it, and the, the engineer said, I got goosebumps, Gray, because it was like Mary Kay was just, like, coming through you. And so that was a big honor. And, and when I ended up getting it, I, I still talk to her husband, uh, Dino Andrade, all the time about, you know, just every time I get something or every time something reminds me of Mary Kay or, you know, I told him, like, how this, this voice has been such a blessing. Like, I mean, it's it paid my mortgage for the past 20 <laughs> years and sent my kids to school. And, you know, I mean, it, it, it's been, you know, kind of the gift that keeps on giving. And so it's, it's, I just... I'm um, so grateful, you know, that that I was able to, to carry that torch on for her. Seeing how uh, 13 Ghosts of Scooby-Doo Daphne was Heather North, did that alter your approach to doing Curse of the 13th Ghost, or did you just go in kind of doing your traditional Daphne? I just went in doing me. I, I, I have, even I'm a theater actress, and sometimes people watch the movie, you know, of whatever play like I did Streetcar Named Desire and I, I didn't want to watch the movie before I did it you know I did watch it after and thought oh that's interesting I made different choices right. I, I don't know right. I just never want any other actors um choices or take on things to influence mine um I never want to be parroting anybody or you know um and it's funny Heather North and I have a, a um a weird uh or had she passed away recently but she was a sweetheart um we actually went to the same church for a while and she was you know she used to play the organ there and um we're just a sweet sweet lady um that's so fantastic have another weird point yeah so daphne's are all colliding um but, but yeah so uh no so I, so I did not listen to hers before i did my take on it um, i've been doing her so long now and, and my my daphne's a little snarkier than all the other daphne's i think you know just because my personality sort of leaked into her um <laughs> so uh i think people kind of expect that at this point daphne's not just a pretty you know side anymore she's <laughs> she's got lots of opinions and she's definitely a modern woman so yeah. i've heard you say that you often find a character by building them from the laugh up and i wondered if you ever applied that to the character of daphne i, I don't even know if we've ever even heard daphne laugh <laughs> oh yeah. well she always laughs at the end when they all have their moment of like <laughs> oh boy you know just like it, just shake, you know shaking their heads and oh right right yeah, so that's where her laugh always comes in in it so um but yeah <laughs> really close to mine. Her, her voice is actually pretty close to mine since I wasn't really trying to do a voice when I did her. I kind of went in as myself, but I'm super into fashion, yeah. so we have that in common. <laughs> so that was never part of the process? Not for Daphne, no. I just I was in such a broken place when I asked okay. for it. So, um, But I, I found her laugh later, and I found her sarcastic side, you know, um, kind of giving Fred a hard time and, you know, just that kind of thing and laughing at Scooby and Shaggy's antics and she's always the most forgiving of the bunch of their them being she always finds their antics more adorable than anyone else in the gang I think <laughs> now Curse of the 13th Ghost it's a bit of a change in focus for the character and I wondered if that was something that you really enjoyed playing because her role is much expanded yeah well I feel like her role gets bigger in almost every project I've even done exposition at this point. It used to always be Velma who told you why they think what they think about who did it. And I've actually, you know, Daphne's gotten a chance to do that <laughs> recently, and it's just such a nice uh, nice departure for her and growth for her. And um, she's got a lot more to say, I think, in general, not just in this project, but I think, you know, she's just getting a ton more opinions and um, people are starting to see how smart she is. She's not just a fashion lady, you know. I kind of like the way it was played, where it didn't seem like some sudden sea change in the character. It was like, this has always been Daphne. She just doesn't always decide to sort of exert that character or that personality. She kind of takes that, you know, well, Fred's the leader, and everybody kind of has their role, and we're all doing our thing. And this was 
this was a moment where it was totally apropos for her to just be like, nope, I got this one. That yeah, um, yeah, it, it, it was kind of seamless. I think she's yeah, she's been talking a little bit more every time, and yeah, just she's she's always been a smart one. She just let uh, Velma have the spotlight every now and again. <laughs> now, when you heard this was the next project on the slate, was there anything you were hoping to see, story or character wise? Um, I, I never, I never think too much about like what the writers are going to come up with. I always like. I'm always really happy with the different little twists and turns that we all get to take. Um, I like to be surprised by things. So I didn't have too many expectations, but I'm, I'm never disappointed with the places the writers take that. And what do you think of Daphne's new look in the film? <laughs> <laughs> she, got, she, got, she got to change her clothes finally, right? Clothes and hair, yeah. I guess <laughs> when you're reading the script, you're not really... No! I, I remember seeing it at Comic-Con, but I can't remember how different it was. I, 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 it is it is nice, especially being she's always into fashion, but she wears the same thing all the time, and her hair is always the same. So it's like, how into fashion is she? You know, um, yeah, it's kind of funny, refreshing. How much do you guys add to the story or character in the booth? I know you and uh, Matthew kind of take your stewardship of the character seriously, and I mean Frank's been there since the beginning, so you know these characters kind of inside and out, and. Uh, I remember talking with uh, John Colton Berry a little while ago, and he was talking about Matthew contesting a, a character moment for Shaggy, saying, no, 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 that's not how Shaggy would do this, and <laughs> told him why, and he was kind of like, oh, yeah, you're totally right. And uh, and they changed it kind of on the spot. And I wondered, how much do you guys add to it in the booth? Well, Matthew is a celebrity, and so he's allowed to say stuff like that. <laughs> I'm just a voiceover. <laughs> <laughs> I just nod and smile and do whatever they tell me to do for scale plus 10. <laughs> I'm just happy Touché. to still be on the show and not replaced, not replaced by a celebrity yet. Uh, yeah. So, no, I, have, I, I, hardly ever, I hardly ever pipe up with anything. I just do whatever the writers tell me. And I'm always happy. You know, usually I, I'm just like, oh, that's an interesting thing. Okay, that's kind of fun. You know, I'm always, I'm pretty game to do anything. So, yeah. Having played so many iterations of the character over the last 20 years, how do you balance previous performance choices with different direction and kind of personal instincts whenever you tackle a new version of the character for a different show or, or one of the D2V movies? Um, Basically, what you've done before, what people are telling you to do, and what you're feeling in your gut. Oh, gosh. I mostly just see what the director says. Um, but... I, I ad lib sometimes funny things. I'm, I'm a comic, you know. I, I do stand up comedy, so I'm I, I'm always trying to throw something funny in there if I can. So I, I do think I add some humor because usually if I throw in a funny line or add some little extra thing, usually when Fred likes some girl or there's some cute girl around, you know, that's helping us with our mystery in that episode, I usually throw out some snotty remark and it usually makes it in. Or roll my eyes, or you know, some kind of catty little. <laughs> You've worked with a number of cast members, including, of course, two of the originals, Frank and Casey. Uh, is it strange to have actors cycle in and out, or is it refreshing to get new blood in from time to time, or is it just a complicated situation? It's it's so bittersweet because I, Mindy Cohen and I were really close friends. I I, I don't see her any as much anymore because you know now that she's not playing. Uh, Velma anymore and and then of course I fell completely in love with Kate too when she started being Velma too and I don't know it's just it, it's sad to see people go but sometimes I fall in love with the new people too I just I like oh, people are great most people are pretty great especially in voiceovers people are pretty down to earth and sweet. so um, I just try to kind of roll with the punches and keep in touch with people when they're no longer there it was it was a graceful transition between Casey and Matt because Casey played um, Shaggy's dad for a while until, the Mystery um, Incorporated, yeah. Yes, so that was a nice. That was a really nice transition, you know. Um, but uh, so maybe if the new Daphne comes in, I would like to play her mother for a time. I, that's all I ask. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fans kind of have the same reaction. Like, I don't think anybody hates what any kind of one individual person has done. It's just kind of you love them, but you're you're kind of pining for that previous relationship you had with. A certain actor yes. or it's like Kate Kate is great but I miss Mindy or you know whatever it is yeah yeah I it, it, yeah it's just I mean I don't know it, it, and I and I feel bad because I know there's so much that goes into you know reasons why and you know um and so I'm just happy to still be here 
<laughs> and ready to move on if they should ever change <laughs> their minds about me. <laughs> so, but every time they, I get a call for a new I'm always like, oh, thank God. <laughs> It's like a, it's like the limbo stick or something. Well, it's not like you uh, you'll be stuck without anything to do if if the Daphne does pass by. But <laughs> there are lots of exciting things uh, on the horizon every day. So uh, yeah, I'm I'm ready to pass the torch whenever someone else needs it. <laughs> I do kind of think the the pitchforks and the torches will come out though. So <laughs> well, at least you I can rest that. easy knowing that. I appreciate that too. I don't know if studios listen to that, <laughs> that kind of stuff, but if they do, uh, that'd be great. <laughs> you said that Daphne has gotten a little snarkier as time has gone on. Have you changed your process at all over the years? Uh, has anything kind of grown, or are you, you pretty much, again, still just doing the the Daphne you sort of started in the beginning? No, I, well, I think as I got more comfortable with the role, a lot more of my personality kind of got into it, Um it's sort of like where does Daphne end and where does Gray begin? I don't know, but <laughs> but in the very beginning, I was really, really trying to play, you know, a lot of safe choices, just trying to make sure I was doing an okay job at the role. But after about ten years, I was like, all right, I feel like I I am Daphne now, and I'm kind of owning it a little more, and I took a little more creative license with it. So, um, yeah. I think ten years is a safe period of time to be like, okay, I own this now. <laughs> Yes, and, the last, and then there's 10 more years, but, so I've definitely uh, become completely uh, free, free, <laughs> free with it. Uh. So what's your favorite Daphne to play? I mean, there's been so many, from What's New to Mystery Incorporated to Be Cool, which I'm told the, the Be Cool Daphne was, uh, again, talking to, to John Colton Berry, he said that that Daphne was very much like Grey as a person, which I thought was really interesting. <laughs> um, I don't know how to take that. That I have a beard or that I'm a... Uh, <laughs> um, um, no, I, I I have a soft spot for Mystery Incorporated. Um, I just really love that series. That was so fun. But I have to say, Be, be Cool Daphne was my favorite because she was such a weirdo, and I'm a weirdo at heart. So... Um, yeah, it was just fun to see what Daphne we're going to get this time. And it was just really, really exciting, the different scripts. You know, every week I was just like, what's, she, what's her shtick going to be? Um, and it was just kind of refreshing to go from, you know, being sort of one of the more boring members of the gang to the most interesting member of the gang. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, yeah, so, and it was funny. I, I feel the thing about that show that I feel is very unfortunate is that, with that new look that they tried, I think it lost a lot of people before they even watched it or yeah. listened to the scripts because those scripts were hilarious. And I think people were just so turned off by that sort of family guy look that they had done that it just, people didn't give it a chance. And I told people, watch that show with your eyes closed. You will laugh hard. So. Yeah, we've we've talked about Be Cool a lot on the podcast over, over the last couple of years. <laughs> yeah, I bet, I bet. No, people... Well, when I do signings and stuff, people there's always people who come up and go, I didn't like the new look. <laughs> this is like every single time somebody has a comment about the look of it. And I've said, yeah, but go back and watch it with your eyes closed, and it will make you laugh, I promise. <laughs> when I heard that you had a comedy special that you were putting together, I was like, just like Daphne on Be Cool Scooby-Doo. <laughs> <laughs> I, I told you I am Daphne. It's like a, a, she's becoming me, or I'm becoming her. I don't know what's going on, but. <laughs> so um, our time's pretty much at an end here. So if there's anything you want to plug, uh, feel free to throw it out. Yeah. Um, well, I, I would love people to watch my comedy special that you just brought up on Amazon. It's called my first comedy special. And it's on uh, Amazon Prime, and it's got all five star ratings so far. So that's good. <laughs> nice. And, of course, Curse of uh, the 13th Ghost, Scooby-Doo, which is available on digital download and home video. Yes, oh, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. All right, well, thanks so much, Gray, for coming on the show. Um, you're a favorite of everybody, and uh, it's, it's been a pleasure having you and asking you some questions about uh, Curse of the 13th Ghost and Daphne in general. Oh, I had a blast, and I, I was uh, proud to take you on the freeways of Los Angeles um, on my way to <laughs> the next voiceover it's, gig. It's like coffee and cars <laughs> with comedians. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm exactly like Gary Seinfeld, I mean, so, and I'm funnier. <laughs> Thank you so much.
so much. What is it about the freeway? (laughs) (laughs) So there you go, gang. That concludes my conversation with Scooby-Doo and the Curse of the 13th Ghost screenwriter Tim Sheridan and star Greg Griffin. That was an absolute blast chatting with these guys. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you're digging kind of the new expanded concept for APNSD Extra. I'm hoping to actually do this more. Bring in some people and talk just very like content specific about stuff. It was also really great uh, reconnecting with Gray. As I said at the beginning of the interview, I had moderated a panel for her at a convention and it was a good time. And I actually, there's a, there's a convention story in there that I left out just because it was, it wasn't relevant to the story, but maybe if I ever do like a Patreon or just start posting like outtakes or cutting room floor stuff, I'll put that out there. At the very least, I know I've got stuff in my back pocket if that ever happens. If you guys want to comment on this episode and what you thought of it, feel free to hit up the Facebook page for a podcast named Scooby-Doo or check me out on Twitter at ScoobyDooCast. You can also send me an email at ScoobyPodcast at gmail.com. Always have to struggle to remember that one. I'm also on Instagram at a podcast named Scooby-Doo. And however you happen to be catching this episode, the podcast is also available on iHeartRadio and Stitcher. Uh, It gets posted to YouTube every time I put the show up. And if you download or stream off of iTunes while you're there, check out Scooby-Doo and the Curse of the 13th Ghost. But also while you're there, rate and review the podcast if you have a second. It doesn't take a lot of time, but it really helps out with the algorithms and getting the podcast in the eyes and ears of people who may not know about it. Also across the board, uh, like, share, follow, subscribe to all the social media and all of the delivery platforms if you would i would appreciate that so there isn't really anything else to chat about just you know thanks again so much to tim and gray for taking the time to chat with me today thanks to all the folks uh, who made this possible and just a heads up that coming up probably in the next week i'm thinking uh will be part two of my jeff parker interview and we talk all about uh future quest and johnny quest and dc Hanna barbera and funky phantom Captain Caveman. Captain Caveman's kind of a hot point right now. So be sure to check that when it comes out. And if I may channel my best Bemelman, that's all there is. There isn't any more. Thanks, you guys. Love you. Take care. And we'll see you next time on a podcast named Scooby Doo. Crystal ball. We have a crystal ball?